uh, the talk is going to be centered around how attackers are abusing cloud applications as a medium for command and control, which is a really nice integration into what we just covered. So hopefully you all take away a little bit something from it. So let me start by uh, introducing myself a little bit. My name is Dag Maui. I am currently a threat researcher at Netscope. Previously, I've had positions as a developer, software engineer, and a security researcher at multiple companies. I have my master's in cybersecurity from Drexel University, and I have, you know, the OSCP and various cloud certifications as well. Um, <laughs> if you ask my personal really close friends to describe me, I'm uh, three equal parts computer nerd, um, fitness fanatic, and right now it's uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, that's, that's the hype, and movie buff. So if you see me kind of wandering around and you want to start up a conversation, any of these will have me talking for hours. So um, that's, that's a little bit about me. On the technical side, I dabble a little bit in CTFs and exploit development, and more recently uh, in cloud application abuse. So, so it's a really nice segue into what we're going to be covering today. So it's my hope that everyone here today takes away four key points with them. Firstly, what is Cloud CT? What do we mean when we say cloud command and control? Secondly, what cloud apps are abused for C2 in the wild today? What are attackers doing in this space? Thirdly, if you wanted to simulate this technique in your own networks, how could you do that? What are some simple steps you can follow? And then lastly, if you did identify a gap, what defenses can you be put in place to identify this technique being used in your corporate networks? So let's start by defining what Cloud C2 is, right? Before you define Cloud C2, however, and in all fairness, uh, I didn't expect the audience to be so technical. So maybe this slide is, uh, you know, a breeze for most of the people here. But let's start by defining what command and control is. So command and control is a stage in the cyber kill chain. A uh, cyber kill chain is a set of steps an attacker uses when compromising is the system, right? It starts with recon, gather some info. They will then use that info to identify a weakness. They'll use this weakness to weaponize a payload, deliver that payload, and that, that payload will ex exploit a particular weakness, right? And then once they've done this, they install a particular piece of malware on the asset that'll phone back home and then pull for additional commands. Now, traditionally, this has been, uh, this has been, uh, this involved a compromise device pulling via mediums like HTTPS and, and DNS directly to the attacker uh, controlled infrastructure, right? And if you wanted to simulate this, you could have done this using tools like Cobalt Strike or Empire. So what is Cloud C2? Well, traditionally, um, like we just talked, attackers have been setting up their own servers, their own domains, their own hosts as kind of the medium for um, the compromised device to reach back out to their console. So you can see this on the top right, um, where the compromised device is going to reach out to that infrastructure, pull for commands. The attacker's uh, console is going to feed those commands back to the, the compromised device. This has been um, tough to detect, but the security community has done a very good job of using uh, threat intelligence feeds to identify the sort of infrastructure. So a security individual can identify this infrastructure, they'll publish it to a threat intelligence feed, right? And then other security personnel can consume this feed and prevent communication to that, to that infrastructure. What we've started seeing, um, this has been around for a while, but it's seen a little bit of an uptick over the past few years, is attackers have started using, or I should really say abusing, cloud apps as a medium for command and control. So they're using things like Dropbox instances, Google Drive folders, you know, S3 buckets, Slack channels as a medium to kind of tunnel these commands back and forth. Now, why would they want to do this, right? Well, firstly, it's very minimal setup. In two to three minutes, you'll have a Dropbox account ready to go. Right. Um, they're oftentimes very cost effective. They have a free tier, a decent amount of time too. So it's, it's free. Um, and then it's, if you're trying to blend in with traffic that already exists, right? It's, uh, and if you're an attacker, that's what you want to do. So you don't want to get detected. It's useful to do this with applications that are being used, that are ubiquitous, right? And, uh, maybe by a quick show of hands, who here has a, a Google Drive account or a Gmail account? Okay, <laughs> let me ask this a different way. Who here doesn't have a Google Drive account or a Gmail account? Okay, so there's like a few people in the back. <laughs> um, if they, if there were like an oddball contest, I would nominate them as winners. But, uh, most people use these, right? Most people use, so if you're in a chat and trying to blend in, that's, that's what you want to opt for. 
Um, so this technique that we call Cloud C2 is categorized in MITRE ATT&CK as well. Um, maybe those of you that aren't familiar with MITRE ATT&CK, it's a framework for categorizing the tactics and techniques attackers are using in the wild today. Um, this particular technique is categorized as abusing web services for command and control or uh, technique 1102, and it's divided into three sub-techniques. Firstly is bidirectional communication. So this is really what we're going to focus in on this talk for. This is where the attacker and the compromised device are communicating, right, sending commands to and receiving output from a cloud app instance. It doesn't have to be the same one, but both the forward and the reverse direction is uh, occur the communications occurring over the cloud app. Now, while we won't cover the other two in depth, it's still worthwhile to kind of mention them a little bit. The second sub-technique is one-way communication. So this is where the attacker is going to send commands to the compromised device, but doesn't expect the output to come through a cloud app instance. So they're just abusing cloud applications to kind of send that, that forward uh, communication. And the third sub-technique is uh, dead drop resolvers. Um, so if maybe you're familiar with like espionage and spy movies, you know what the concept of a dead drop is, right? So a dead drop resolver is kind of like a digital version of a dead drop. This is where the attacker is abusing the cloud app to host information that points to additional C2 infrastructure, right? So we have an example of a, of a YouTube comment here. This is where the attacker was kind of had a comment where they said, my keyboard doesn't work and then some gibberish, but then on the second line is a base64 encoded endpoint that the compromised device is going to pull down, decode, and then reach out to. So this is the third sub-technique. So that's kind of a really quick introduction into what we call Cloud T2, or Cloud Command and Control. Now, let's talk a little bit about the trends that we see in the wild today. Is this even, you know, is this even really happening? Like, who are attackers really doing this? Let's take a look at some, some data and you know, kind of answer those questions. So in this slide, it's a little bit of a noisy slide, but what I wanted to show is uh, malware samples and the cloud apps they've abused for command and control. And you can see Boxcon, Nimble Mamba, and Crutch have abused Dropbox. Graphite and Light have abused OneDrive. There's been uh, Slack abuse, GitHub abuse, Google Drive, Twitter, Tumblr, Blogspot, Google Docs. You know, the list goes on, right? Um, what we really want to show is there's a lot of variety here. Attackers are using a lot of these apps to kind of... Um, send their commands back and forth. And this is just a small select list. There's a much more detailed list on MITRE's page, right? So what we really want to show here is that there's no cloud app that's kind of immune to this. Attackers are, they've, they've abused this or they're either going to abuse this in the future. Okay, so in the previous slide, we kind of looked at um, instances of abuse. Right, but what we also wanted to see is some aggregate insights, right? What are some trends that are happening? So we looked at 23 known and reported instances of abuse over a two year period from April 2020 to April 2022. Now these are just known and reported instances. So there's likely a lot more that maybe aren't known or have not been reported, but we just started with these for now. And we looked at the cloud apps that have been abused over this two-year period. And we see that there's a general trend here, right? Dropbox is the most preferred app at eight instances, followed by OneDrive at five, and then Google Drive at four. And then after that, you can see a Telegram at two, Slack, Google Docs, Google Sites, Glitch, GitHub, Gmail, CloudFront, and CloudFront, all at one instance. Right, and this, you can see there's a general preference towards the first three, right? Dropbox, OneDrive, and Google Drive. And this preference is even more pronounced if we look at, if we categorize these cloud apps based on the services they provide to their customers. So cloud storage apps, by far the most preferred at 17 instances of the 23, and then followed by a not so close second of social collaboration and CDN apps all at two instances, and then web design platform as a service to and tools a webmail all at one instance. So when we see something like this, we kind of ask ourselves, um, why this huge kind of uh, preference towards cloud storage apps, right? And while we can't really know the exact reasons until we survey these attackers and ask them why they made the decisions that they did, what we can do is we can infer um, based on the actions that they've taken, why they chose the applications that they did. And this goes back to the first three points we mentioned in the beginning, right? They're very easy to get set up. Right, all of these three accounts, specifically Dropbox, OneDrive, and Google Drive, make it super simple, kind of get set up and get going. 
Secondly, they're very popular, right? And if you're trying to blend in with traffic that exists, that those are the apps you're kind of going to go for. And thirdly, and this is a trickier one, is how integratable are they to the kind of the existing workflow of traditional C2, right? So traditional C2, what do you do? You have the compromised system is going to take some data, encrypt it, encode it, HTTP post it to a server. Well, with um, cloud storage, all you have to do is take that data, write the file, upload it to a cloud instance, right? It's two to three lines of code that needs to change versus an app like uh, GitHub. You have to create a repo, add it to a local repo, push it up, right? There's a little bit more that's involved. And attackers are doing that still, but you just don't see it as much as uh, cloud storage applications. Um, what we also wanted to look at is, um, we looked at the preference in each category, but we also wanted to look at the features that are abused in each category as well. So we looked at um, cloud storage apps already, right? You talked about them a little bit. What we noticed in these uh, applications is that attackers are uploading files, downloading files, deleting files. In social apps like Telegram, we've seen bot usage, right? Reading messages, writing messages. Collaboration apps like Slack, we've seen channels, right? Replying to messages. We've seen CDN apps like CloudFront, we've seen proxying that traffic. And web design apps like Google Site, we've seen DJ-like algorithms to pass data to a different URL every day. We've seen attackers use Glitch to create custom apps and upload files. GitHub apps to create a repo, add commits, right? In webmail apps like Gmail, we've seen writing drafts, writing emails, attaching files as, as attachments to these emails. So really, um, what's really interesting here is attackers are, uh, they're not kind of taking their existing workflow and kind of shoving it into the cloud app. They're actually leveraging the features that these cloud apps are providing. So they're kind of reaping the benefits, getting, the, you know, getting uh, their money's worth out of using these cloud applications as well. So we kind of started off with a little bit of the, you know, the non-technical stuff. We defined some terms, we defined Cloud C2, and then we looked at some insights that happen in the wild today, right? Now let's take a little bit of a closer look and let's take a look at how you can simulate this in your networks using tools that exist so that you can see if the controls you have can identify this tactic. We're primarily gonna do this using three tools, um, Empire, C3, and uh, Covenant, and we're gonna, do this uh, you know, simulation using two apps, Dropbox as an instance for cloud storage, and then Slack as an instance of a collaboration app. And then for each of these apps, what we'll do, we'll talk about what the cloud app was meant to do, why the, cloud, why the attacker might prefer these cloud apps, a uh, real world example of uh, this, app, this app being abused. And then for the bulk of this, we'll have a walkthrough of how you can simulate this. And then finally, we'll look under the hood just briefly of how this cloud app is being abused. So um, I think most of the people here know most of these tools, but just in case, uh, Empire is a PowerShell and Python 3 post-exploitation framework tool. It's open source maintained by BC Security. Uh, it's it's Linux-based, so if you maybe you're a Linux person, this is a tool maybe you want to opt for. Covenant, on the, hand, the other hand, is Windows-based, so it's a collaborative .NET C2 framework. It's also open source, um, and these two are kind of uh, similar in that one, except for the platform. Um, and then C3 is slightly different. Um, or C3 stands for custom command and control. While the other tools kind of focus on the command execution and interpretation portion, C3 kind of focuses on the medium. So it provides a, a framework for rapid prototyping of these custom C2 channels, and then it integrates with tools like COBOL, Strike, and Covenant, allowing you to kind of, it'll kind of offload that command interpretation portion to these to these other tools. It's developed and maintained by F-Secure Labs. So any of these tools are like a blast to work with. So if you're looking for some you know, new tool to kind of play around with, I highly recommend these. Um, so let's start with a deep dive into Dropbox. Uh, Dropbox is a popular cloud storage app. It's abused by uploading and downloading files like we've talked about. It has a very flexible app development interface and it exists as both an enterprise and personal cloud, which kind of further entices an attacker to use, use this particular application. Um, so let's go over one real world example of abuse. So this is a threat actor named Morat was abusing Dropbox earlier this year. Now this is a threat actor that's known for being stealthy uh, and they've used this uh, particular technique tactic before as well. What was interesting in this instance, they, they were using multiple Dropbox instances and they had the responsibility segregated among them. Um, and you kind of see this in the attack flow on the right. This is pretty um, typical attack flow we're seeing at that given, at that moment in time, you know, malicious office document gets downloaded, 
executes some PowerShell command, which, uh, you know, download executes another backdoor, which communicates. Ah. Let's give it a second. Which communicates back to the attacker via these Dropbox instances, right? So, um, you know, they had one Dropbox instance for uploading commands, another for downloading, another for file filtration, et cetera, right? So they, they kind of went through the, the phases to make this more robust. So if one Dropbox instance gets compromised, they have these other ones to reach out to the compromised devices as well. So how can you simulate this? Well, you can do this using Dropbox C2, C3, or Empire. We just opted for Empire. It's somewhat arbitrary. You can really do the same with any of these other tools as well. We're going to follow a four-step process, just to keep it simple. We are going to create the Dropbox account. Then we're going to set up Empire uh, with this uh, with an access token from this Dropbox account, basically integrate those. And then we're going to generate a malicious, uh, malicious payload and deliver that to a victim to simulate a compromise. Now, Normally, in a real engagement, what you'd want to do is maybe send a phishing campaign that downloads, you know, a, a maldoc file, malicious link file that will then download this as a next stage payload. But we're skipping all of that just for the sake of brevity here. And then finally, once you have all of these pieces set up, we're going to interact with the compromised device by sending commands through through Dropbox. Both the the victim and the Empire server on internal networks. So all the communication is happening over over this uh, Dropbox account. Um, again, you can kind of see the end result here, right? So the Empire server is going to upload commands to the account. The agent or the malicious process is going to download those commands, execute those commands, and then upload the results back to the, the Empire server. So <laughs> basic stuff. And you can see the top on the top, right? There's a little legend, so you can kind of follow where we are. But we're going to... Probably the easiest step here is we're going to create a Dropbox account. It takes like two minutes, right? And then we're going to create an app uh, on the developer platform. We're going to give it full access to the account, full read and write permissions, and we're going to name it Empire C2. You don't see it in the screen because I cropped it too much, but there's a section right here where you can um, copy the access token to be used in the next step. Then we're going to go ahead and set up this Empire listener with the access token from the Dropbox account. So um, we used to already set up Empire. Then we uh, set this API token. We're going to type execute. I'm skipping a bunch of steps here. I'm going to assume that everyone knows how to <laughs> set up Empire. Um, but then if you type, if you do everything correctly, once you type execute, you should see that the Dropbox listener has started uh, successfully. And what this does is it this is going to go ahead and create a folder in our Dropbox account that's going to be used for communication. Um, in this case, the, two, the folder is named Empire. That's just the default. You can change that up if you want. But um, in this Empire folder is going to create three subfolders uh, for results, staging, and tasking. So it's kind of like laying the groundwork out for us so this compromised device can reach back out to the attacker and kind of uh, establish a communication channel. Then we are going to generate this payload and deliver that to the victim to simulate a compromise. Um, we're going to do that using the stager module in Empire. So you can see this on the top right. We've set the listener to be the medium. We've just um, kind of established a Windows batch file to be this um, malicious payload. Then we're going to execute that on the victim. And then that's going to spin up a process that's going to beacon back to the, the attacker. And you kind of see this... Um, if everything's set up currently, an agent's going to be created in our console. We have the details like the agent name, the language, the IP address, username, the process name, process ID, all that cool info. And then importantly, you have the listener, which is happening over a Dropbox account, right? We have a quick demo here. Let's see if this, uh, this doesn't break. Okay. Okay, so we have this is on the victim machine. We're pulling down this uh, Windows batch file. We're going to execute this and kind of go through the flow of what's happening, right? So um, we're going to run it as admin because why not? And then that's going to create this uh, PowerShell process on the on the attacker side. What we see is um, takes a second, but this agent will check in. It's a multi-stage deployment, so it takes a few seconds to kind of get set up completely. Um, I probably should have cropped this part out, but uh, you can see the agent 
kind of check in, just give it a few more seconds, going to completely get set up. Yeah, and you see all the details we just saw in the previous screen, right? So we're going to start interacting with this agent. We're going to issue commands like who am I and you know, a list of the processes. Um, it, one thing to note here is that this agent is going to work on a polling architecture. So it takes, um, it does take a while. Let me pause this. It takes a while for this agent to kind of check into the Dropbox account to see if there are any new commands. Um, so while we wait, we're just going to look at this Dropbox account and see what's happening. You see how this communication is occurring is this, um, this uh, attacker is going to upload these, these uh, text files, these encrypted uh, text files that the victim is going to pull down, delete, execute, and then upload the results uh, for. And you can see the, the name of these files, is just the name of the agent. That's what I was trying to show. Um, so it does take a few more seconds to complete execute. It kind of missed it, but you see the details come back, right? So you have process name, process ID, architecture, username, memory information as well. Um, so if you go back to the victim and kind of look at the, um, so this is Fiddler. Uh, I don't know if uh, maybe not everyone knows Fiddler. So Fiddler is a, a web proxy we have running on the victim machine that'll show us all the HTTP requests going out from this victim machine. Um, and what we want to take a look at is how this communication is happening from the PowerShell process. You can see that it's reaching out to this API Dropbox, Dropbox API endpoint, it's getting details around this, um, text file and then it's going to go ahead and and you know download this this text file and uh, parse it but if we try to look at what the contents are of this file at this moment you can see that it's you know gibberish not legible this is kind of going back to the previous talk where in the if you're in the middle of this you just can't understand what the communication is right since it's encrypted uh there we go okay <laughs> Um, so what did we just look at? We saw how this interaction is happening by uploading and downloading these files. Uh, if you try to look at what one of these files contains, you can see that it's it's not really legible at this stage, and that's because um, the data is being you know, encrypted so that you know, people in the middle don't really understand it, right? Uh-oh. Try to break it. Okay, there we go. Um, so let's summarize what we just looked at. Dropbox is a cloud storage app similar to OneDrive and Google Drive, and similar to these apps that are used by uploading, downloading, and you know, deleting these files. You can simulate a threat actor using these tools in your network, using tools like Dropbox, C3, or Empire. And we didn't mention this, but you know, depending on the sophistication level you're trying to model, you can kind of do a few different things here. If you're trying to model a unsophisticated threat actor, just use the default config. See if you can identify that, right? If you want to model a moderately sophisticated threat actor, you might customize those configs a bit and try to see if you can standard the radar of the controls you have in place. If you're trying to model a highly sophisticated threat actor, you know, something like we've seen with these targeted attacks in the real world, use multiple Dropbox accounts. See if you can get that set up. Or, um, really tune the traffic to match what's existing in your network. So if you notice that there's a particular user that uses Dropbox, maybe use that person's machine to kind of send these commands back and forth so that traffic kind of blends in with what's already there. Let's do like a similar uh, thing in Slack. That was kind of quick, but in the interest of time, let's do one more with Slack and see if there's a uh, Let's see what the differences are here as well. Um, Slack is a collaboration app, obviously, right? It tends to be abused by creating channels and then uploading, downloading, um, or writing and replying to messages. Again, this also exists as an enterprise and a personal cloud. So if you um, see that the, the corporation uses Slack, maybe you want to use this to uh, send your commands back and forth from that environment. Um, let's go over one real world abuse for Slack as well. The Eclip particular threat actor was found abusing Slack late last year, a little bit earlier this year. Um, they were targeting an Asian airline to steal reservation information and they were sending, you know, information files, commands through these, uh, through Slack. What was really interesting in this case is they were actually using different Slack channels. So they would use one Slack channel to send, uh, 
commands to the victim, another to download commands, and then a third one to kind of upload the, the results of those, uh, res the results of those commands and then any files that were requested as well. So they're kind of leveraging this key for Slack, these channels in Slack to kind of get that money's worth like we talked about. So if you wanted to simulate this, you can use tools like Slack or Classic 2 Bot or Slack Shell. In our flow here, we're going to use a C3 Recovenant, and we're going to follow the steps outlined by F-Secure. Those are some you know, great detailed steps. Uh, we're just kind of summarizing them into these four steps here. Uh, we're going to, again, follow the same four-step process, create the account, set up C3 and Covenant with these access token. Then we're going to generate a C3 payload, deliver that to the victim to simulate a compromise. And then we're going to interact with this device or this compromised device by tunneling commands through Slack. So first steps first, we're going to sign up for a Slack account and then we're going to create a set of app credentials. So um, we signed up for the Slack account already. We're going to go to the Slack API and then create uh, the Slack app. You have that Slack app credentials there, um, kind of read out. Um, and then we're going to set up C3 and Covenant using the steps uh, outlined by F-Secure. These, um, two are, these two repos, these two projects kind of maintain at different paces. Um, and like anybody that's maybe tried to set up two different tools at the same time, you might run into some compatibility issues. Um, we found that particular commit hash to be the most uh, stable to, to, to kind of work with. So it uh, might save you a few days, maybe not days, maybe a few hours worth of kind of banging your head against the wall, right? Um, and if you've... Um, so we're going to go ahead and create this gateway. So that's, that's what the um, C3 server is called. So we're going to create this gateway, and then we're going to create the channel. So the, the one at the bottom is like... The, purple one, that's that's what the, the Slack channel should look like once it's been set up. And then, so what does this, this do, right? Once you've created the Slack account and then integrated it with C3, what happens in the in the Slack account? So it's going to go ahead and create this, ch this Slack channel and then it's going to um, add that app or that user into this, this channel. So this is kind of similar to that Empire flow we saw where Empire folder is being created in the Dropbox account. Here, a Slack channel is being created. And then we're going to go ahead and kind of uh, generate the C3 payload. Um, C3 has a really cool UI that you can kind of create and download a, a relay from. So the relay is kind of uh, the terminology for a payload in, in C3. So we're going to generate this payload, uh, download it, just copy it over to a victim machine, and then uh, execute that so that we can see that, that communication. And then, um, so this is Covenant, um, and then that C3, we're trying to get it in the same slide. But once you set everything up, you can go ahead and execute commands um, in, in this grunt interface in Covenant. And you can see that um, the commands are going to go from the gateway through the channel to the victim, get executed on the victim, and then the output is going to get tunneled back to the gateway. So that's how this interaction occurs. Like both, again, both the compromised device and the attacker machine are on internal networks. So all the communication is occurring over this Slack channel. So what does this look like? So we don't have a demo here, but we have a cool GIF. Um, and you know, the problem with GIFs is you kind of have to wait until the restarts to kind of start explaining it. So bear with me one second. I'll tell you when it's going to start up again. Um, so right here. On the attacker side, we're going to try to issue a list of the processes. Th those commands are going to get written through this channel. You can kind of see it happening quickly. And then the victim's going to pull that down, delete it, and then upload the results. And the attacker is going to pull that down, delete it, and then show the results in the UI. So if you go through that one more time, um, list of the processes is requested by the attacker console. The Request is going to get written to the Slack channel, right? The victim's going to pull that down, delete it, and upload the results. It's, then the attacker console is going to pull that down and show it to the, the interface. Oh, um, by the way, this is my favorite part in the whole in the whole talk. So if you leave right now, you haven't missed a whole lot. Um, but let's summarize what we talked about in Slack as well, right? So. 
Um, Slack is a collaboration app that's abused by sending messages via channels. If you're going to send lead a threat actor using this, you can use C3 and Covenant to do this. Um, and C3 is actually um, a really cool tool that has other channels as well. So if you have, uh, I think they had like 10 or 12 different apps that you can use. So if you have other apps in mind, you can use that tool as well because that's what the tool really focuses on is these, the, the medium that you're sending commands through. And again, if you want to model different sophistication levels, you can do that using... Um, you can do that using this tool, right? So an unsophisticated threat actor, just use the default configs. If you want to model a moderately sophisticated threat actor, customize those configs a little bit with a tool like Empire C3, right? And then if you want to model a highly sophisticated threat actor, like these targeted attacks we see in the real world, use multiple channels. Or again, highly tune the traffic. If you see this specific department in... Um, particular company that uses Slack, maybe the development department, maybe use those machines to kind of send those commands back and forth. Oh. Okay. So let's go over what we talked about from the UNE, right? So we started by defining what Cloud C2 is. We defined it as command and control that's abusing, uh, that's, that abuses cloud applications. And then we went and defined, and we saw some trends that are happening in the wild today. And then we saw uh, some trends. I already said that. We saw some trends, and then we categorized some of these apps, and we saw some of the features that are abused in each category as well. Then we went over um, a little bit of a deep dive, and we saw how people are abusing two particular apps or how you could use, abuse two particular apps to kind of send these commands back and forth. Now, what we want to cover in this section is, okay, you fight, you've identified that maybe an app isn't being detected. What can you do? Before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about why is this hard to detect, right? Why, why is this, the, why can't we use um, existing kind of signature-based solutions? Or what's challenging about using those solutions to identify the sort of traffic? So this is a screen cap from um, Fiddler, the Fiddler UI, and we we were running. So this particular uh, instance, we are running the commands through GitHub, um, and we had the GitHub Desktop app running at the same time we had this relay running that was sending commands back and forth through through the GitHub application. And what you can see um, here is the communication going out from both of these processes, and they're both the malicious and the benign traffic is going to the same domain. It's going to api.github.com, right? This domain is a valid cloud provider domain and the traffic to this domain is encrypted the same way benign traffic would be encrypted, right? This is why it would be hard. You can't put in, you know, GitHub's IP addresses into a threat intelligence feed and kind of uh, block all traffic to GitHub, right? So you kind of, um, from the defensive side, this presents a new set of challenges that you have to approach slightly differently. So what can you do there? Um, and I know I'm going to say the first one, like it's very simple and everyone can just do it like that, right? But tr if you can, try not to let it get to the to the C2 stage, right? Try to block the malware as best as possible. Because once it gets to, to the C2 stage, it's very, very challenging to try to... Um, prevent the sort of traffic from, from, from occurring, especially if it's using a cloud application provider that, um, that is maybe popular in your network. Secondly, if you can, disallow non-corporate cloud apps. If nobody in your corporation is using Dropbox, then maybe you don't need to use um, Dropbox. And maybe if you can't disallow it, because maybe there's a few people that collaborate with other people external to the company, maybe monitor connections to that app instance so that you can see if anything anomalous is occurring. Thirdly, um, and this is an OWASP top 10, make sure you have adequate logging and monitoring from the processes in your, in your environment so that you can see if um, you know, communication is going to a particular cloud app instance that maybe isn't, isn't warranted or is anomalous. And then finally, for this slide, um, beaconing behavior. If you see any kind of, uh, this is a screen cap again from Fiddler going out to um, GitHub, right, from a, a relay. If you see these beaconing process processes occurring over um, 
a small set of time, a small period of time, that's something you maybe want to keep an eye out for as well. Um, another one, if you see any unsigned applications making um, network connections, that's also, a, you know, that should not be common use case. Or that should be something very rare that occurs in your network. So if you see that happening, that's something you want to be on the, on the lookout for. Um, unusual user agents also uh, a giveaway. So if you see um, the Empire user agents kind of static, and that's not really used as much anymore. So if you see that user agent, maybe that's a very unsophisticated threat actor trying to get into your um, trying to get into your system, right? And then the last two, um, they're inherited from. F secure. So F secure's blocks kind of wrote this. Can't really take credit for those two. But what was the first one is really interesting. If you see uh, any packet count anomalies in your network, that's something you want to you want to identify as well. So what they did was they modeled their corporate network and all the communication going out from their from their network over a period of time, and they saw the packets that were being transferred from um, these processes. And you can see once a particular endpoint is compromised the number of packets it sends out across time is kind of stands out compared to all the other processes in the network. Cause that's, you know, it's very anomalous behavior to have this process beginning out to GitHub every, you know, two seconds asking if the same repo, the same URL every second, you know, that's a, that's a very strange thing to do. So that's something you can um, use as a signal to identify this particular technique as well. And then finally, the last stage in the, Cloud C2, um, sorry, in the cyber kill chain, the one that follows command and control is actions on objectives, right? So maybe if you're not able to see the C2 stage because it's happening once a week to GitHub and that's very tough to detect, usually the in the actions on objective stage, um, they'll perform some data exfiltration. So if you see any large amounts of data that's being moved off of your corporate network via this strange GitHub account, Maybe that's something you want to be on the lookout for and defend against as well. So let's um, take a step back and kind of summarize everything we talked about. So I think I'm a little early, so let's take our time with this slide. Um, so what is so we started by defining what Cloud C2 was, right? So with Cloud C2, we defined it as command and control that's abusing cloud applications. Right, we defined some terms um, like traditional C2 and how Cloud C2 is different from traditional C2. Talked about how attackers might prefer Cloud C2 over traditional C2, namely that um, you know they're very easy to get set up. Right, they're often cost efficient to use. Depending on the cloud app, it might be easily integratable to the existing workflow. And if they're ubiquitous and popular, these cloud apps kind of uh, integrate really well, um, sorry, if popular and ubiquitous, then it kind of entices the attacker to kind of use these cloud apps to standard the radar and not be detected. Then we went over and we defined some trends that exist in the wild. We saw what cloud apps can be used for C2. We saw that a vast majority of them are actually being abused um, today for command and control. And there's a lot of variety there. We categorized some of these cloud apps and we saw some um, features that are abused in each category. Then we went over and kind of talked about how you can simulate this in your own networks, right? We saw that you can do this with a four-step process with two apps, primarily Dropbox and Slack. We saw that you can use tools like Empire and C3 to kind of abuse these cloud apps and get, you know, kind of really standard the radar a little bit. Um, and we also saw some real world abuses for both of these apps, right? So if you want to simulate a real world attack that's targeted like the ones we saw, we kind of presented configurations with open source tools that you can, or open source tools with con configurations that you can get set up today and kind of mimic what's happening. And then lastly, we talked a little bit about what sort of defenses can you put in place to identify these, right? And we didn't um, do this, the topic justice from the defense aspect, but in the interest of time, we kind of focused a little bit more on the attack and how you can simulate the attack portion. And then this defense area is going to be an active area of research that we're going to kind of drill in on and have a whole separate uh, conversation about that, right? But we did present some controls that you can use to detect Cloud C2 today, right? Um, 
primarily around anomaly and behavior analytics to kind of identify these strange processes that are beaconing out. So <laughs> that's kind of the last of the technical stuff. My colleagues have asked me that if you're a big fan of Star Wars and you maybe want something to show people that you're a fan of Star Wars, that there's uh, uh, something at the Netscope booth, so go you know, grab it before, it's, uh, before they're done. Um, and if you have any questions, um, I'll try to take a few if we have time. But um, in case in case I don't, that's my Twitter handle is at dogmulu and my LinkedIn is dmulugeta. All the stuff that we're researching is going to be up on our blog. So, you know, feel free to kind of follow any of these or, you know, reach out to me. I'd love to talk cloud app abuse or really anything cybersecurity. So, you know, feel free to kind of reach out. Um, and last, that's that's kind of it. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them now. Perfect. Thank you very much, Takmami. Yep. Um, let's give him a warm welcome. So we do have indeed uh, one or two minutes um, while we get Stefan to set up uh, his laptop um, and then blacking out the, the whole <laughs> thing again, I guess. Let's find out soon. But any questions? What's your favorite cloud tool to use for CNC? I mean, that's my question, but maybe you have a different one. If, um, if maybe they, they don't have questions, I have maybe a question for people in the audience that are red teamers. Um, get, get like conversation going a little bit. Um, so any, anybody that's a red teamer here maybe has used uh, Cloud App Abuse in the past or Cloud App for C2 in the past, or maybe hasn't. Will you guys use this in the future? Do you see any challenges with using um, Cloud Apps for C2? Is that that would a show be of hands? Anyone might give it a try, or are you still just sending emails and people still clicking on it, so you don't <laughs> care? Okay, I see a few. Awesome. All right. I guess if there's uh, no more question, then yes, thanks very much. Uh, he will be available for questions. Yeah.